Moby Dick, by Herman Melville. Chapter 16. The Ship. In bed we concocted our plans for the morrow, but to my surprise and no small concern, Gweek had now gave me to understand that he had been diligently consulting Yojo, the name of his black little god, and Yojo had told him two or three times over, and strongly insisted upon it every way, that instead of our going together among the whaling fleet in harbor, and in concert selecting our craft, instead of this, I say, Yojo earnestly enjoined that the selection of the ship should rest wholly with me, inasmuch as Yojo purposed befriending us, and, in order to do so, had already pitched upon a vessel, which, if left to myself, I, Ishmael, should infallibly light upon, for all the world as though it had turned out by chance, and in that vessel I must immediately ship myself, for the present irrespective of Gweekeg. I have forgotten to mention that, in many things, Gweek had placed great confidence in the excellence of Yojo's judgment and surprising forecast of things, and cherished Yojo with considerable esteem, as a rather good sort of god, who perhaps meant well enough upon the whole, but in all cases did not succeed in his benevolent designs. Now, this plan of Gweekhug's, or rather Yojo's, touching the selection of our craft, I did not like that plan at all. I had not a little relied upon Gweekhug's sagacity to point out the whaler best fitted to carry us and our fortunes securely. But as all my remonstrances produced no effect upon Gweekhug, I was obliged to acquiesce, and accordingly prepared to set about this business with a determined rushing sort of energy and vigor, that should quickly settle that trifling little affair. Next morning early, leaving Gweekhag shut up with Yojo in our little bedroom, for it seemed that it was some sort of Lentil Ramadan, or day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer with Gweekhag and Yojo that day, how it was I never could find out, for, though I applied myself to it several times, I never could master his liturgies and XXXIX articles, leaving Gweekhag, then, fasting on his tomahawk pipe, and Yojo warming himself at his sacrificial fire of shavings, I sallied out among the shipping. After much prolonged sauntering and many random inquiries, I learned that there were three ships up for three years' voyages, the Devil Dam, the Titbit, and the Pakiot. Devil D.A.M., I do not know the origin of it. T.I.T.B.I.T. is obvious. P.E.Q.U.O.D., you will no doubt remember was the name of a celebrated tribe of Massachusetts Indians, now extinct as the ancient Medes. I appeared and pried about the Devil Dam, from her, hopped over to the Titbit, and finally, going on board the Pequod, looked around her for a moment, and then decided that this was the very ship for us. You may have seen many a quaint craft in your day, for aught I know. Square-toed luggers mountainous Japanese junks, butter box galleots, and what not, but take my word for it, you never saw such a rare old craft as this same rare old Pequod. She was a ship of the old school, rather small if anything, with an old-fashioned claw-footed look about her, long seasoned and weather-stained in the typhoons and calms of all four oceans, her old hull's complexion was darkened like a French grenadier's, who has alike fought in Egypt and Siberia. Her venerable bows looked bearded. Her masts, cut somewhere on the coast of Japan, where her original ones were lost overboard in a gale, her masts stood stiffly up like the spines of the three old kings of Cologne. Her ancient decks were worn and wrinkled, like the pilgrim-worshipped flagstone in Canterbury Cathedral where Beckett bled. But to all these her old antiquities were added new and marvellous features, pertaining to the wild business that for more than half a century she had followed. Old Captain Peleg, many years her chief mate, before he commanded another vessel of his own, and now a retired seaman, and one of the principal owners of the Pequod. This old Peleg, during the term of his chief mateship, had built upon her original grotesqueness, and inlaid it, all over, with the quaintness both of material and device, unmatched by anything except it be Thor Kilhake's carved buckler or bedstead. She was apparelled like any barbaric Ethiopian emperor, his neck heavy with pendants of polished ivory. 
she was a thing of trophies, a cannibal of a craft, tricking herself forth in the chaste bones of her enemies. All round, her unpaneled, open bulwarks were garnished like one continuous jaw, with the long sharp teeth of the sperm whale, inserted there for pens, to fasten her old hempen thews and tendons to. Those thews ran not through base blocks of land wood, but deftly traveled over sheaves of sea ivory. Scorning a turnstile wheel at her reverend helm, she sported there a tiller. And that tiller was in one mass, curiously carved from the long narrow lower jaw of her hereditary foe. The helmsman who steered by that tiller in a tempest, felt like the Tartar, when he holds back his fiery steed by clutching its jaw. A noble craft, but somehow most melancholy. All noble things are touched with that. Now when I looked about the quarter deck, for someone having authority, in order to propose myself as a candidate for the voyage, at first I saw nobody, but I could not well overlook a strange sort of tent, or rather wigwam, pitch a little behind the main mast. It seemed only a temporary erection used in port. It was of a conical shape, some ten feet high, consisting of the long, Huge slabs of limber black bone taken from the middle and highest part of the jaws of the right whale. Planted with their broad ends on the deck, a circle of these slabs laced together, mutually sloped towards each other, and at the apex united in a tufted point, where the loose hairy fibers waved to and fro like the top knot on some old Potawatomi sachem's head. A triangular opening faced towards the bowels of the ship, so that the insider commanded a complete view forward. And half concealed in this queer tenement, I at length found one who by his aspect seemed to have authority, and who, it being noon, and the ship's work suspended, was now enjoying respite from the burden of command. He was seated on an old-fashioned oaken chair, wriggling all over with curious carving, and the bottom of which was formed of a stout interlacing of the same elastic stuff of which the wigwam was constructed. There was nothing so very particular, perhaps, about the appearance of the elderly man I saw. He was brown and brawny, like most old seamen, and heavily rolled up in blue pilot cloth, cut in the Quaker style. Only there was a fine and almost microscopic network of the minutest wrinkles interlacing round his eyes, which must have arisen from his continual sailings in many hard gales, and always looking to windward for this causes the muscles about the eyes to become pursed together. Such eye wrinkles are very effectual in a scowl. Is this the captain of the Pachyote? said I, advancing to the door of the tent. Supposing it be the captain of the Peatwood, what dost thou want of him? he demanded. I was thinking of shipping. Thou waste, waste thou? I see thou art no Nantucketer, ever been in a stove boat? No, sir, I never have. Dost know nothing at all about whaling, I dare say, eh? Nothing, sir, but I have no doubt I shall soon learn. I've been several voyages in the merchant service, and I think that... Merchant service be damned. Talk not that lingo to me. Dost see that leg? I'll take that leg away from thy stern, if ever thou talkest of the march and service to me again. March and service indeed. I suppose now you feel considerable proud of having served in those march and ships. But flukes. Man, what makes thee want to go a whaling, eh? It looks a little suspicious, don't it, eh? Has not been a pirate, hast thou? Didst not rob thy last captain, didst thou? Dost not think of murdering the officers when thou gettest to sea? I protested my innocence of these things. I saw that under the mask of these half-humorous innuendos, this old seaman, as an insulated Quakerish Nantuckener, was full of his insular prejudices, and rather distrustful of all aliens, unless they hailed from Cape Cod or the Vineyard. But what takes thee a whaling? I want to know that before I think of shipping ye.